For today, we're going to be talking about um, critical care ultrasound, and particularly vascular access. Um, so this is one of two um, lectures. So we'll be giving the second one next week. Um, so we're going to split it up. Today, we're going to be talking about um, central lines with femoral, IJ, um, subclavian, as well as pit lines. Um, and then in the second session next week, we'll be talking about arterial lines, paracentesis, and thoracentesis. So we don't have any um, conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, and the focus of our presentation is really on ultrasound guidance to, to augment procedural performance. Um, and obviously it doesn't replace it hands-on practice um, at the bedside. So our overall objectives are to review the indications, contraindications, um, ultrasound techniques, as well as complications of ultrasound guided central venous lines um, and how to properly document and bill for these critical care procedures. So just um, very briefly on the history of ultrasound use for central lines. So the first ultrasound guided central line placement was documented back in 1986. Um, and it really started as more of a Doppler with um, static landmark identification. And at that time, these machines were so large, bulky and expensive and not portable that um, it, it showed a lot of mixed results and people weren't really into it. Um, but as technology has improved um, over the last really like probably 20 to 30 years. Um, it's, the literature has really shown benefit for, for ultrasound use, first amongst adults and then pediatrics. Um, so without getting into too much um, detail and boring people with, with a lot of studies, um, these are some of the, the main studies um, which look at how ultrasound use in pediatrics for central lines. Um, and, and really, they all have very similar conclusions. Um, so really overall, the time to complete cannulation shorter, um, less needle pass attempts, um, higher rate of successful first attempt and fewer overall complications. Um, and then moving on to the next slide, um, this was a, a meta-analysis that was used, that was looked at um, and published in pediatrics in 2018 um, and took a lot of these studies and, and really showed, um, broke it down first by femoral vein cannulation between ultrasound and landmark techniques. And we can see that um, clearly ultrasound here is favored. Um, and then um, they then moved on to the IJ vein, um, which was clearly favored by ultrasound. Um, and then when even when you put them both together, which is on the next slide, um, it, still, it still remains um, ultrasound being favored. They also looked at uh, risk of arterial puncture. And you can see that um, there's a lower risk of arterial puncture with ultrasound use than not. So I think um, the, the literature overall is pretty clear saying that we should all be using ultrasound for, for our central line placements. Um, so we'll talk a, a brief briefly about a case um, and then kind of build off of that. So we have a six month old previously healthy male who presented um, to the ED with a five day history of, of URI symptoms and poor PO intake. Um, he was noted to be tachycardic, had some poor perfusion and hypoxic to the mid eighties on arrival. He was initially trialed on high flow um, and then was intubated for rapidly progressing respiratory failure. Um, an IO was placed and he was transferred to the PICU on an epinephrine drip of uh, 0.1 mics per kilo per minute. Um, so this kind of leads into our next um, conversation of, of indications and contraindications for central access placement. So um, your indications are need for one, need for reliable venous access. So if you can't get access any other way, um, if you're going to be giving vesicants, such as uh, our vasoactive infusions, like in this case, um, TPN or high concentration electrolytes, uh, frequent blood sampling for hemodynamic monitoring, such as um, central venous pressure. And then separately, um, in order to have uh, undergo dialysis, CRT or plasmapheresis, um, placing a central line for that. There's overall very few absolute contraindications, if really, if any, because um, obviously um, these are typically placed in an emergency and, and we can, can't, sometimes we, there's no, we have no other choice but to do it. Um, but there are some relative contraindications. So site specific. Um, so for a femoral vein, uh, so it's for a patient with abdominal compartment syndrome, you probably want to avoid putting something in their femoral vein. Um, some people with uh, increased intracranial pressure avoid your neck vessels. Uh, coagulopathy. So that's definitely a relative contraindication because we have to put lines in kids who are cardiopathic, but um, just balancing the risk benefits um, and how, how urgent the line is. Do you correct the coagulopathy first or do you go ahead and place your line? 
Um, active bacteremia, which is um, even more relative contraindication. Um, we see this in sepsis a lot. However, um, if you're talking about a more long-term line, such as a tunnel line or a tunnel dialysis catheter, um, you probably don't want to place those while someone's actively has active bacteremia. Um, if you have an infection of the area over the target vein as well, like a cellulitis, um, you'd want to avoid that area as well as thrombosis of the of the vein um, would make it difficult and possibly perpetuate your your thrombus. So um, a little bit about your our transducer that we would use. Um, so most commonly used is your high frequency linear array transducer, which we can see on the bottom right there of the screen. Um, and this typically gives your highest resolution images um, for superficial structures. Typically, we say a max depth of about six to 10 centimeters. Um, and for kids, that's that's typically plenty deep unless you have like a very obese adolescent. Um, sometimes you, you people may use your curvilinear probe. Um, we, don't, we won't get into too much of the ultrasound physics because we had that in a separate lecture in the series, but we know that um, fluid-filled structures are hypoechoic, like you can see on the screen um, off to the right, and then your dense tissues such as your needle, um, bones, um, and soft tissue are more hyperechoic. So when you first get your image here, um, you want to always distinguish what, what is your vein versus what is your artery. Um, so your artery is the one in this image, it's um, below your vein. It's that very um, circular shaped with a thick wall. Um, it's pulsatile and not compressible. And your vein is more of a triangular shaped, um, thin wall and fully compressible. And it's often um, changes in size with respiratory variation. So you can see here um, on that image, you can see clearly the, the uh, providers compressing down um, on the ultrasound. You can see the vein collapses and the artery stays patent. Um, we could move to the next slide. So um, prior to to the procedure, um, you want to use your ultrasound, like we said, to identify this baseline anatomy. Um, and you want to measure the size of your vessel to understand the appropriate size catheter to use. So typically, it's suggested that you keep your catheter um, less than one third to one half of your vessel diameter. Um, and one French equals 0.33 millimeters. Um, so we can see here on the right side um, is the conversion in this table of French to, to millimeter. So you can have an idea of, of what size line you should be placing um, based on based on the size. And then you wanna look at your safest needle insertion site. So you wanna um, scan the, the vein kind of up and down to look for the widest diameter, um, the shallowest depth, uh, not trying to avoid overlying the artery as well as to make sure that there's no thrombus present. Um, you can use Doppler if you're having trouble um, determining what is arterial versus what is venous. Um, and you can see on the left is a transverse axis um, with the red going toward the probe blue away. And then on the right um, screen is, is a longitudinal view um, of both your artery and vein. You can also use pulse wave Doppler um, as well. Some um, Most machines will have this. Um, and what you do is you take your cursor um, over the vessel and you look for, for um, Doppler pulsatility. So you can see that on the right here is the um, arterial waveform, and then on the left is more venous. So once you kind of figure out where you want to go, you have your vessel that you're going to approach. You always want to obviously use an aseptic approach, um, including a sterile probe cover, and you want to use real ultrasound, real-time guidance to puncture the vein. Um, so Initial studies or initial ultrasound use was kind of static, um, but as as we've developed, um, it's pretty much standard of care now to, to use dynamic ultrasound. So positioning, you want to also make sure that you align your vessel and ultrasound in the same linear view. And this is very important and often see fellows not, not doing this. Um, so it, it's very challenging. It's, well, not, it makes it a lot more challenging when you're your field's right in front of you, and then you're off looking like over your shoulder to the left at your ultrasound machine. So try and keep everything in the same view um, to keep things nice, uh, nice and smooth, and you don't have to constantly keep like looking back and forth. So there's a few different views. Um, first being your transverse axis. So this is um, an example of a IJ vein, and how you approach. So you typically approach at a 45 to 60 degree angle. 
and you have your you have your probe um, perpendicular to your vessel. And what you're going to do is you're going to pierce the skin, and then you're going to slowly follow, advance your needle about one to two millimeters at a time as you advance your ultrasound probe. Um, and you're going to follow your needle tip directly into the vessel, and you're going to get an image on the right over there um, where that end is your needle tip. And that's typically what we call either like your target sign, target sign or bullseye sign. Um, and that shows that the, the needle itself is in the middle of the vessel, which is what you're looking for. Um, some people prefer to do longitudinal view. Um, so your longitudinal view, you now your probe is um, lined up directly with your vessel. Um, so about 180 degrees. And you're going to go in with your needle um, and you're going to be able to, in this view, um, you're going to be able to watch your needle go all the way directly into your vessel. And you'll be able to see the whole length of your needle underneath the probe. Um, this is a little bit more challenging to do, and the short axis is typically easier, especially for a beginner. However, um, this gives you full kind of view of your needle. Um, one thing you need to worry about is if your probe kind of moves slightly off axis, you could end up um, seeing your artery as opposed to your vein. Um, so you have to you have to be careful to to kind of make sure that you're going into the right place. And this is an example of a long axis um, where the a video where the needle is um, accessing the vessel. Um, there's also a third view, which is the oblique axis. Um, this is probably the least commonly used um, from what I've seen. And this is kind of a mix of a transverse and longitudinal view where you can still see your needle there going directly into your vessel and you're still kind of have um, your vessel a, a more of a transverse view. Um, so it's kind of a mix of both. <clears throat> I, I've never personally used this view. I don't know if anyone else on the call we can talk after um, has and had success with it, but it's another view that's been um, been shown. So um, the question of which, which view do you typically use? Um, this is a study that had about 100 patients undergoing an IJ um, where, with half assigned to short and half assigned to long axis. And the success rate was overall very similar, um, but posterior wall punctures were more common in the short axis group um, where the needle went through and through, um, which is which is pretty common. Um, so we typically say short axis is probably the easiest way to, for new ultrasound learners to master first prior to moving to long axis or oblique axis. Um, your next step is to, to confirm your needle tip is centrally located within the vein, like we showed um, on the prior image. And if there is, if once it's there, you should be able to pull back on your syringe um, and get blood returned. At this point, you'd disconnect your syringe, advance your guide wire, um, and it should go in nicely without hitting any significant resistance. If you are hitting resistance, um, you may need to reposition your needle. Um, so if you're kind of up against the back wall, you may have you may have to pull out a little bit. Or sometimes when you're um, dropping your ultrasound to grab your wire, sometimes you move your needle a little bit, and that little bit of a movement, you're now out of your out of your vessel. So you may have to readjust yourself. Um, once you have your wire in, you always want to confirm um, that it's in the vein and not the artery prior to dilating. <clears throat> um, and and typically we say to do this in both the short and long axis, um, just to just to confirm. And you can see here, oh, that's okay. You can see the image here just shows the the guide wire um, in your in your IJ vein, um, so it's in the correct place. Once um, you have your wire in, um, you want to remove your needle, and then you want to dilate as needed um, and insert your catheter over the wire. And once again, um, you can confirm your placement of your catheter in both the short and long access view. So th all of these procedures that we talk about, including your thoracentesis, paracentesis, they're all they're all very similar. Um, they all utilize Seldinger's technique. So just kind of a review of what we spoke about. Um, in the first picture, you're going in with your needle, accessing the vessel, getting blood return. Um, two, you're inserting your guide wire into your needle. Um, you're making an incision, you're removing your needle. And so now you just have your wire left. You make a, a small incision in the skin to allow you to dilate. You insert your dilator, um, remove your dilator, and then insert your catheter. Um, remove your wire and then flush um, all of your ports.
So we'll we'll talk a little bit now specifically um, of the different the anatomy based on where you would um, place your central line. So we'll start with um, the IJ first. So your IJ is typically formed by the apex. So it's there you have what you're looking for anatomically is your sternocleidomastoid. So here on the image on the left, you can see your um, two area, your two sternocleidomastoid muscles in your clavicle here form your triangle, and you have your um, vein and your artery right next to each other. So you put your when you put your ultrasound over this area, what you're going to see is a similar image here on the left with your um, a lot typically your your IJ vein, which is a lot larger than your common carotid artery. You'll probably get part of your sternocleidomastoid muscle in your picture, um, which is at the top. And then you, sometimes you'll catch part of your trachea or thyroid, um, depending on your location. Um, and what you want to do is you want to um, scan from the angle of the jaw all the way down to the insertion side of the subclavian, because you want to make sure that, one, there's no thrombus. You want to make sure that there's no stenosis of the vessel, and you want to make sure that you're accessing the, the, the best area that will give you the most success. Um, these are some abnormalities that you may run into um, as you're scanning. So on the bottom left here um, is a large thrombosis of your internal jugular vein. So you can see um, even as the provider compresses, um, there's no compression and you can really see the, the large clot in the vessel. Um, that The top um, left image is a carotid artery dissection. So you can see the um, wall there flapping around um, in the artery itself. On the next to that is another example of a static image of an IJ thrombus. And then the lower um, right image is an example of a stenotic IJ. So you can see that your IJ is significantly smaller than your common carotid artery. Um, so whether there's a hematoma surrounding it um, or, or some other, for some other reason it's um, getting kinked, you can sometimes see this and that would be a challenging placement for your IJ. Um, you want to, wh while you're, um, while you're putting your needle in, you want to really make sure that you're set up in the best way possible. Um, ideally you don't want your vein directly on top of your artery. Um, cause if you go through and through your vein, sometimes you'll end up in your artery, like, like it can be seen in that image. Um, so proper, the proper setup is, is very important, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, so what you want to, you want to have the patient's head down um, at about 10 to 15 degrees. And this helps not, not only reduce the risk of air embolism, but it helps use gravity to your advantage um, and have better filling of your IJ vein. And you want to rotate the patient. So if you're accessing the right IJ, you want to rotate your patient's head to the left um, to kind of help open up that space. Um, next, the femoral vein. Um, We'll talk a little bit about the anatomy here. So kind of going back to med school days, I think we all remember nerve artery vein um, is the from lateral to medial. Um, so every, this is your typical anatomy that you'll see. And then on your ultrasound to the right, um, you'll see your femoral artery next to your femoral vein there. Um, and you can see the in this image, there is a needle tip in the femoral vein. Um, you can see a little dot right in the middle um, just to show kind of what it would look like. Um, for this, the positioning is a little bit different. So you want to lie either the patient flat or, or slight reverse trend Allenberg. Um, you want to place typically a towel under their hips. And this helps slightly elevate them. Um, and this helps enhance the exposure to your inguinal crease um, insertion site. So it helps um, also separate your, your um, vein and artery away from each other. Uh, sorry, the you want to abduct the leg and externally rotate. And this helps um, kind of separate your vein and artery a little bit away from each other so that one's not right on top of the other. And it also helps bring the vessels closer to the surface um, to make it a little bit easier. These are some um, abnormalities in the femoral vein. Um, so we can see here, the first image on the left um, is a color Doppler image uh, of the femoral vein. We can see a large clot in the, in the lumen there um, with some color surrounding it. And then you can see the uh, femoral artery off to the right there, um, which you're not getting really the color Doppler directly over. Um, in the middle is a longitudinal view of that same clot. Um, and you can see that it's a very large clot. It takes up most of the lumen um, and it's kind of perpetuating back and forth. And in the third image, um, we can see that 
the provider is compressing um, down and we can see that there's no compressibility of the femoral vein on the left. Um, and that's also a sign that you have a, a clot there. And then with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Ahmed. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so <laughs> next to the back to our case, uh, were failed. So the patient, the six month old who was intubated earlier on for rapidly progressive respiratory failure required vasoactive. So back, so IJ was unsuccessful and due to short neck. And uh, so the decision was made to try to cannulate the subclavian vein. Let's see if that a good idea or not. So back to indication, con contraindication, it's the same as what Dan talked about generally getting the central lines. Probably there is no obsolete contraindication. There are no obsolete contraindications. Uh, just you have to be more cautious with coagulopathy because you don't have, a, usually if they are coagulopathic, if they bleed, usually you just put a direct pressure either in the IJ or in the groin. But you don't have, if you poke the artery, you don't have a, uh, access to a direct pressure. That's why if you have a coagulopathic patient, try to not put a subclavian in case you inadvertently uh, injured the artery. The advantage of subclavian, I mean, the, there are many advantages for the subclavian. Uh, it's less prone to collapse during hypovolemia, which most of the case when you, if you're putting a central line in a septic patient who's uh, intravascularly depleted, usually the subclavian gets, so the subclavian diameter, not sorry, the SVC, it's subclavian SCV diameter does not vary much with inspiration because it has a strong attachment to the fascia of the adjacent structure. So usually the vein uh, diameter is preserved in hypovolemia compared to the internal jugular and the femoral. Uh, it's a great uh, for comfort for ambulation for the IJM femoral, it's easy for them and it's just a neat line. Uh, so the collapse and thrombosis rate, the, the data, yeah, there were earlier some data about its lower collapse and thrombosis rate. Probably in pediatric, that does not that will translate to an absolute numbers, but it definitely it's a clean line. And especially for neurocritical care trauma, they have if you have a patient in cervical color, of course, the IJ is not ideal there. And of course, the groin is always a little bit that is concerned about the infection there. So especially patient also with tracheostomy, also you don't want to put a neck a line that's where usually the trach has many. So if you could put in the subclavian and tunnel back, that's that's usually an advantage compared to the internal jugular in this case. The complication pneumothorax is probably is more is the most feared complication uh, with the subclavian uh, uh, lines because uh, of course because the subclavian is just above the pleural line and it could easily you know their arterial puncture but usually that's the risk is the same probably as internal jugular and the femoral and that usually is immediately evident because usually you get a bright pulsatile blood but you have to be cautious sometimes you may not. If you have a patient who is cyanotic or severely hypoxemic, so it may not be bright. And uh, also, if you have a patient who is hypotensive, that might not be as pulsatile as you expect an artery to be. Malposition, which is probably uh, is uh, more likely to happen if you're cannulating subclavian compared to the others. And we will talk about why. And uh, all these complications have been shown to be lower in subclavian if you're using ultrasound versus the anatomic landmark. And Pinchoff syndrome is another uh, unique complication to subclavian. Of course, this is a pneumothorax. Well, I think there is another talk about uh, the, uh, the lung finding in pneumothorax, but this is what's called the barcode or the absence of seashore to scatter for uh, usually the absence of lung sliding. You you could see that this it should be evident if you're using ultrasound to confirm your line, you should be able also to immediately look for the complication after more. So this is an X-ray finding for uh, malpositioned uh, subclavians. You see both the left subclavian, the the image in the left, uh, the, sp uh, the line migrated up to the right IJ instead of going down through the a nominant to SVC, and which is probably not a big deal uh, most of the time. And the in the uh, image in the right, actually, this uh, patient uh, probably had a 
persistent cleft SVC to the coronary sinus. It's not a true actually malposition, but this is usually if you if you see it, the line in the left side, that's usually sometimes concerning for malposition in the artery. But this patient just ended up this as persistent cleft SVC, and the line that was in good position to be used. So the pinch off syndrome is if you're putting subclavian, especially that sometimes get pinched between the clavicle and the first strip and uh, uh, clue the lumen of the catheter. And uh, this is a schematic picture. And this is on the right side, the 3D image of that. And that is more common with the pores. But it's, yeah, the catheter could be clued if it pinched off between the two bony structures. So evidence for ultrasound. So the uh, subclavian uh, classically or used to be thought it's due to the heavy bone structures and uh, usually is not amenable for uh, ultrasound guidance because usually the bone is, you know, an amenable ultrasound. But that's probably not true. We knew that over the last 15 years that actually cannulating the uh, subclavian vein through ultrasound is, uh, is very feasible and actually very successful. And there are multiple studies, including this one that show that it's higher success rate and lower uh, complication even compared to the uh, IJ, which is the easiest. These are multiple studies and most of them actually, there were no complication. Oh, the caveat to that there, these are small studies, except for Kokarani study, which he had a 150 patient. Most of the other are, in the two digits, but most of them had no complication and they used this, uh, and they were able to successfully cannulate in most of the cases uh, without any major complication. Of course, in uh, there are two studies, especially that showed serial puncture and one pneumothorax. But uh, Brishan, for example, he's 183 catheter, he had 99% success rate uh, and 83% first attempt success rate with no major complication. And this was probably the second most. So this is the anatomy. Uh, so the anatomy, of course, uh, so the subclavian is a continuation of the axillary uh, vein as it passes uh, under the clavicle. And usually it's joined by the uh, uh, IJ from the epsilateral side, either to, to make uh, brachycephalic to the uh, SVC. Uh, that's you put in the right side, has more longer continuation of the innominate vein to the uh, SVC. So of course, yeah, it's usually the, the between the clavicle and the first strip. That's usually trans the transition between the axillary vein and the uh, subclavian vein. Uh, the artery is usually nearby, and uh, especially in the right side, you have you worry about the uh, phrenic nerve. And I have seen one case of uh, phrenic nerve injury secondary to subclavian. That was a surgically placed uh, uh, midpoint for long-term access. So usually in the right side picture of this sonographic image, you could see that there is a valve, which is usually a venous structure. Usually you don't see the valve in the artery. If you see a valve, it's it's a venous structure, but be sure that's not a clot. And uh, you see the, the pleura is nearby, and that's usually one uh, an important landmark to try to not poke. And uh, there is intrathoracic artery in the first strip. There are differences between the uh, the right subclavian and left subclavian, more than just compared to the left IJ and left femoral when you compare them to the, their right side counterpart. Uh, the right uh, subclavian usually takes a, a more acute angle uh, to go to the SVC, which this makes it sometimes harder and more likely to for the guide wire to be malposed and uh, the catheter to migrate north. But usually, as we can talk about later on, is just an important thing also to confirm your wire position in the vessel and compare that the wire went down to the SVC to the RA, especially if you didn't see uh, any ectopy during insertion. That's sometimes suspicious that your guide wire may went no. Uh, the lift subclavian is usually uh, it, the angle is less of a problem and easier shot uh, directly to the uh, SVCRA junction, which is the optimal position for a tip of any line. 
So, of course, this does not replace the bedside teaching and how to do this. Uh, but important positioning, uh, the Tridlenberg, uh, for several reasons, maybe mainly reducing the uh, risk for air embolism, because usually if the heart is higher, is higher than that, less likely if you get any air to go there. And uh, if you put a small bedroll, it does not, I mean, I... I did this in the past and I did a bigger one and that made it harder for me to cannulate subclavian. So just small is enough and turn the head to the contralateral. And uh, I, fi I find it good to put it uh, arm side by side. Some people extend it a little bit, but I think this might be even easier. So those positioning, of course, is very important of central uh, putting in a successful center line. And the Trindlinburg position, actually there is a, a good data that says it increases the diameter for the vessel uh, and you know, without compromise. Sometimes if you increase the diameter of the vessel, especially if you give uh, with holding, increase the intrathoracic pressure, you may increase the, the diameter of the vessel, but also you decrease compromise the diameter between the subclavian and the pleura. And actually, Trindlinburg and it has shown that it increases the visual diameter without compromising the distance between the subclavian and the pleura, which is an important uh, risk factor for hemothorax. So, uh, this line, I, in, it, it varies. In neonates, usually uh, it's supraclavicular, uh, which is the easier for line. And use a hockey stick. Uh, probe and insert it in the supraclavicular fossa and just to try to align those structures and uh, especially the uh, subclavian, the brachiocephalic and keep an eye all the time with, and usually do the long axis. Of course, the long axis as then when it's for the novices earlier on, it's hard because you need to be really still. Any movement you could change from the uh, scanning the vein to the artery yeah, so you need to be really still, but it it with a practice, it's not a big thing, but always just try to align these structures and uh, search it under always under direct sonographic guidance, the needle slowly, no rush. And of course, so this is uh, uh, the picture in the left is the main anatomical picture. You see the one in the right side where you see the the guide wire. Uh, with artifact behind it. So this was in the long axis. And you see the pleura. Yeah, so I think it was labeled probably short axis. This probably was a long axis. Uh, courtesy to uh, Eric, I think he gave me this picture, but it probably looks to me like more like uh, long axis. So always keep the needle under sonographic vision all the time, because these structure, I mean, it's a millimeter between the uh, the subclavian vein and the pleura. Uh, uh, a little bit, especially if you use supraclavicular, you have to be in the sh shallow angle to avoid posterior wall puncture. And uh, when you put your wire and just scan the epsilateral IG, especially because as it's most like the, it's very more common than other vessels to uh, go to the epsilateral IG and melt position. And uh, back to. Yeah, so we'll briefly um, talk about pick line placement as well. Um, all has pretty similar technique um, to central line. So um, some pros and cons. So pros to pick line placement. So often it's less discomfort for the patient, um, especially patients who are ambulating. Um, having a femoral line is, is annoying. Having an IJ in their neck um, can, can be annoying as well. Um, as far as discharge planning goes, so if patients are going to go home on IV antibiotics for like a long course, then a pick line um, allows for that. Um, frequent blood draws, and then it give, It also has the option of single versus double lumen. Um, cons for a pick line placement. So it may cause increased risk of infection and thrombosis compared to other um, central lines that we've spoken about already. Um, and sometimes it can be tricky 
guiding the tip to the correct location. So most most PICU providers don't have fluoro experience or, or access to fluoro. Um, so sometimes you can end up with your tip either in the IJ or too deep or too shallow, et cetera. Um, so this is the venous. So typically when we think of PICC lines, we, we mostly focus on the arms. Um, the This is the an example of the um, different veins of the arm. So typically we go for the basilic um, or cephalic vein. Those are the two largest. Um, the brachial vein is very close to the brachial artery and nerve. So we try and avoid that um, if possible. And sometimes you can also go a little bit lower down on the arm and, and, and advance your wire up. So the technique itself is very similar to that of a central line. So we can see in this um, top left picture, we can see you access the vessel, you have blood return, you advance your wire. Once your wire is in, you take your needle out um, in that middle picture. Then you nick the skin. Um, some people nick the skin for dilation. Um, some people don't, um, but you can nick the skin to allow you to then dilate, put your dilator in. Once your dilator's in, um, which is a little bit different than a central line is you then remove your, your wire um, and then you insert your, your catheter through your dilator. Um, once you advance your catheter um, all the way to the correct position, um, you then need to remove your dilator. So your dilator peels downwards. Um, so you kind of, you s s snap it off um, and then, and then peel it off. It's, it's hard to explain in an image itself um, and definitely easier to, to see hands on. Um, so when should we be doing central lines versus pick lines? Um, this was a study that in the last, I believe in the last couple of years that, that came out, um, which was a, a large um, amount of, I think about 2,700 um, catheters. And they looked at um, pick lines versus central lines. So this for this first um, multivariate analysis here, this is factors associated with central line associated bloodstream infections. And you can see um, clearly catheter days. So the more days it's in, the, the more likely it is to be infected. But below that, um, in the box, we can see that line types of so PICC lines were significantly more likely to develop infection compared to central venous catheter. And then on the next slide um, is a multivariate analysis. So this looks at venous thromboembolism. Um, and this based on line type. So we can see that PICC lines also have a higher, significantly higher rate of um, venous thermoembolism compared to our other central lines that we put in. So um, with that being said, I know uh, our group has slowly started to go away from pick lines um, versus central lines. Okay, now you you put your central line or your pick line and you want to be sure that you did a nice job and put it where it's supposed to be. <clears throat> of course, so the traditional method has been x-ray and that's probably still used in most of the places, but nevertheless, the ultrasound is probably is superior to that. So until like he, he proposed years ago, it's probably six or seven years ago, that we should eliminate uh, radiating the patient for uh, to confirm any central line placement. And uh, the other advantage of that is not just uh, elimination of radiation, but also it's much faster. So ultrasound usually requires less. I mean, you only two minutes. Uh, yeah, which is probably even generous here compared to 23 minutes for a chest radiograph to uh, confirm the tip of position. And that could be a lot if you're resuscitating a patient uh, uh, who can an extremist. If you wait 20 minutes, that's... So there are multiple ways. You know, with, for example, this is a big line. Then it could uh, that was this is a subcostal view of the ultrasound. Uh, where uh, just you could see that the liver, the IVC, and you could see the tip of the big line catheter that's uh, entering the at this uh, IVC to RA junction. And. This is an epical four chamber. This is a, a patient who came in ex undifferentiated shock and acquired intubation in the line. And probably could see there's an echogenic because uh, in the RA, but also part of that this tells you that it gave you uh, another function that this is patient has a very poor function and the 
LV is fully moving. So that's just, and that's added to your uh, clinical data. And in the less straightforward, there's, uh, this is a, a flush study, which is uh, shown to be 100% sensitive and quite specific, over 90% to confirm uh, the position for a first femoral line. It was done in the cath lab where agitated saline is flushed in the catheter after insertion and while scanning uh, the heart. And then if you, if you see it immediately uh, the agitated saline in the heart, then that you will confirm you're in a venous structure and in central venous structure. A delay is suspicious of possible malposition. And this is, was 100% sensitive and 90% specific lab pictures. Next slide. So this is where the sub typhoid you took a subcostal view, and uh, in image A, you could see the agitated saline to, uh, in the RA, which is considered to be a positive flush test, and the absence of uh, the ag saline agitated in the uh, picture B is indicative of a negative uh, flush test. But if you didn't see that your agitated saline meet in the RA, that's usually suspicious of malposition. So this is a suggested, not a validated protocol, but of course, start with uh, uh, confirming the guide wire when you place it always in two views in the short and long axis. Even if you use short axis uh, to access the uh, the vein, I will confirm the, the guide wire in the position by using both short and long axis. Uh, you could always start with subcoastal. Uh, if the baby is small, you could use the bicable or an apical four chamber, but this will give you some physiologic data and also try if you, you could see either with, the, with flushing or without flushing, you could see the tip of your catheter. Uh, and if you're in doubt, you could flush it and see it immediately. And uh, now you confirm your your line is in good position. Be sure that, especially if you did a neckline, you didn't uh, have any uh, of the anticipated side effects. You can scan at the same time for pneumothorax which I think that's this will talk will be uh, talk at a different point. but this is a you could see in the right uh, this patient has left sided pneumothorax by an X-ray and you could see the barcode sign or the absence of seashore which is the normal lung sliding but you have an absence of uh, uh, lung sliding you just have look stratosphere sign or barcode sign as another which usually suspicious for pneumothorax. So take subcostal, take apical four chamber and put mid clavicular at the uh, uh, side where you put your line and to look for uh, signs, uh, sonographic signs of pneumothorax. Awesome. Um, so now that you've chosen the appropriate location, you've decided your patient truly needs a central line, you've gotten your line in place, you've looked for any complications, now it's time to get credit for what you've done. Um, so image storage and billing is something that is really not fun part of our jobs always, but is, is really important for many different reasons. Um, obviously it's important for patient care so people can see what's actually happened to the patient. In the future, they can go back and see um, if there were any complications or any things that were different about this patient that they might not expect. Um, and at the end of the day, it is important that we get paid for what we do uh, because we need to keep coming to work. Um, ultrasound billing is incredibly complex. Um, I, I am certainly not an expert. I don't know that anyone on this call is truly an expert in the billing piece of this. Um, and I would really suggest discussing with your local billing professionals because there's a lot of interpretation as you start to dive into billing codes and ways that things are bundled um, and you know the way that things conflict if a patient's having multiple procedures in a day. So um, please, 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 just if you're going to start a billing pro process, um, talk with your local billing professionals because they really are the experts and um, keep up on the things that we probably don't. Um, in general, the guidelines for billing for vascular access. So ultrasound guided vascular access is a very specific thing. Um, and as we talked in the beginning, you can use ultrasound either statically. So you look at the vessel, you put down your ultrasound, you access without using it as kind of a guide by, you know, step-by-step -step guide. Um, in order to bill for it, in order to really bill for an ultrasound guided procedure, you need to be using your ultrasound dynamically. So you need to be following that needle tip, following along, making sure that your needle is accessing your vessel, um, and then documenting that. 
Um, for paracentesis and thoracentesis, which again, we'll talk about next week, static guidance is acceptable, but vascular access, you need to have that dynamic process and you need to attest that in your note and you need to store an image. So if you're going to bill, you need some sort of image storage process. Um, the guidelines um, of the, the billing laws state that that needs to be part of the permanent record, but it doesn't state how and it doesn't state where that needs to be, but somehow it needs to be a part of that patient's permanent record. Could it be that you go ahead and print that out and scan it into the patient's chart or keep it in a paper chart? Certainly could be. Um, some places have a more smooth system where things go automatically into the patient's image files through their electronic medical record. Any of those based on the current laws are acceptable, um, but you need to have some way to do it. Uh, at the end of the day, this is what the code says. Um, this billing code is for central venous access with ultrasound guidance. It says it requires ultrasound evaluation of potential access sites, documentation of the selected vessel patency, concurrent real-time ultrasound visualization of your vascular needle entry with permanent recording or re and reporting, right? So there's a lot of flexibility within that. Um, and again, it's gonna just depend on your local interpretations, exactly how your institution will fit those guidelines. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the important parts are as follows. So you need to document what you're doing. Um, it's important for patient care and for billing. You need to document the why. So why is this medically necessary that you obtain consent? This is just good medical practice. It needs to include your procedure details, that ultrasound was used. And again, the key phrase is that the needle was guided and visualized under ultrasound is a suggested phrase. Um, you ideally, in my mind, should document your vessel size and your line size so that, again, if you can go back and say, oh, there was this complication. How did the, you know, how did the vessel size compare to the line size? Was it maybe we could have used a smaller, um, you know, a smaller line and maybe decrease the risk of thrombus? This is important, I think, for data collection as well as for individual patient care. Um, and again, you need to try to save your images. So what is your target, either your organ, your vessel, whatever fluid collection? Ideally, it would be labeled with anatomy and orientation so that somebody looking at it, you know, two months down the line pulls up your image and they can actually understand what they're seeing, um, even if they don't have the probe in their hands. And video is helpful, but not necessary. Um, that being said, 15 videos is not helpful. Obviously, you want to be selective. More doesn't always equal better. Uh, but obviously, capturing representative videos, if possible, is really helpful to people going back and looking at your patient's chart. Um, this is one example. This is our procedure note that we use here at Nationwide Children's. Um, it obviously has a lot of selectable fields, um, but does have a lot of the key phrases that are built in um, to try to help people do the right thing. Um, so it has your diagnosis, your indications for your, um, for your exam or your um, procedure. It has the consent documented so that, again, you're committing that you've talked to the family and you've taught them why, how, and you've gotten consent to do the, permit, the um, procedure. Um, we go through a pre-procedure count of all of our sharp things. We do a measurement. Um, and again, just a nudge that the, your suggested line size is about less than 50% of your vessel. That's just based on data showing that that decreases your thrombus risk, um, any procedural medications given. And then it goes through and documents the procedure details for vessel access. Again, using that key phrase, uh, the vessel was accessed, the needle advanced to ensure proper trajectory. And then that was all under direct ultrasound guidance. Um, and it has the attestations um, going forward. So this stays in the patient's chart. Um, um, we are in the midst of transitioning to a system where the images will actually be in the patient's chart um, directly from the ultrasound machine, which is great. So somebody will be able to go into our image review, just like they would look at a chest x-ray. They'll be able to pull up, you know, ultrasound for vascular access. They'll be able to see the images that were saved and they'll be able to see this documentation. So if they are doing a line in the future, they can get a sense of what that, pa that patient's vessels looked like. So um, there isn't one perfect way to do it, but I think there are some really good key components. Um, there's a bunch of references out there. Um, there are, you know, as we mentioned, many studies um, that have been pulled into Cochrane reviews, which are kind of really easy to digest, I think, when you look at some of the images that we've selected for you in this talk. So if you guys have any questions, we're happy to answer those, um, talk through some vascular access, and then we will be back next week to talk about some all alternative procedures.